2023 was yet another year of international crises. This week, Power and Politics is digging into five geopolitical flashpoints to watch in 2024. Our coverage spans four continents, two wars, and a pivotal election that could define the international order for the next four years. We've spoken about the Middle East and India, and today we dig into Ukraine and Russia. The two countries have been fighting a full-scale war for nearly two years. Global attention was at first seized by the war. Canada, the U.S., and many European allies poured billions in military, economic, and humanitarian aid into Ukraine. The Ukrainian military was successful in repelling Putin's initial invasion, holding on to Kyiv, and recapturing more than half of the territory occupied by Russian forces. But now, both sides have dug in. Territorial gains are limited, casualties are mounting, and material support for Ukraine is slowing down. Andriy Shevchenko is head of the Ukrainian World Congress mission to Ukraine. He previously served as Ukraine's ambassador to Canada. Roman Waschuk is Ukraine's business ombudsman. He previously served as Canada's ambassador to Ukraine. Both are in Kyiv. Gentlemen, good to speak with you again. Thanks so much for joining us. Very welcome. Thanks for having us. Uh, Andrea, I'd like to start with you, if I could. Uh, in recent days and weeks, Russia has been hammering Ukraine with drone and missile attacks. How have these attacks affected Ukrainians, affected Ukrainian infrastructure? It's just as painful as it used to be. In a way, nothing new. We are getting used to this sort of barbaric attacks. But the main thing, I think it's a very harsh and dramatic reminder to us. We are at a crossroads. Either we find a way to push Russia back, or we will have to pay zillions of dollars and uh, thousands, thousands of humans' lives in the future. Roman, um, Russia has been using Iranian drones uh, for a while, and we're now seeing them use North Korean ballistic missiles, contributing to the situation that, that Andre just outlined. What, what do you make of these developments, in particular North Korea? Uh, <clears throat> the Russians are able to be persuasive with their partners, more persuasive than the Ukrainians have with their Western partners, frankly, who continue to be reluctant to supply uh, the kind of rockets that could prevent these attacks. Where Ukraine's been more successful uh, than last year is in air defense. Uh, by mid-January last year, we were in month two of power cuts, blackouts, uh, generator, widespread generator use. We're not there now, at least not in Kyiv. Uh, but uh, the, the Russians continue to ramp up their capability to try to now break through the improved air defense. And ultimately, the only way to stop that is by hitting the launch sites, not by trying to play only defense all the time. So, so Andre, just on that point, I, I mean, President Zelensky, he's been pleading with Western nations uh, for increased military aid, especially in that critical area of air defense. We're seeing things stalled, in particular, in, in the United States. I mean, how dire is this need right now inside Ukraine? Well, Kiev is now a relatively protected city, and when I say relative, it means uh, people still die in Kyiv. Also, it's, it has uh, some very good uh, air defense, but it's just one big city. And uh, it's a large country, and uh, the Russians have a lot of territory to, uh, to do their barbaric airstrike. One more thought. Uh, most of the missiles that we see uh, in Ukraine right now falling uh, down from the Ukrainian skies uh, on our cities. They are produced uh -huh. still with uh, parts that Russia got from uh, from outside. Uh, many of those parts were produced in Western democracies in the recent months. And I think it's a great shame. And I think we must be much more uh, creative and much more efficient in uh, cutting those supply uh, lines. So, so just on that, Andre, is that because the sanctions regimes aren't tough enough, they're not being enforced enough, or Russia has just found a way through, you know, third countries or different things like that to, to get around it? All of that, and I think there is a clear need to make that a big priority. So, so Roman, the, the recent increase in, in the Russian attacks, it, it comes at this time, as we were just talking about, where big-ticket EU and U.S. assistance packages for Ukraine 
they're stalled, and, and, and the American situation is certainly fraught. I mean, er, earlier on in the war, you described Western support as enough to keep Ukraine on life support, but not enough for Ukraine to win this war. How would you describe the current level of support? It's wobbly. Uh, I think what we're seeing is a group of European countries that are deeply committed to helping Ukraine. That's the Scandinavians, for example. Uh, we're hearing positive things from uh from the UK, uh, the Germans have stepped up, especially on air defense. Uh, the problem is that as time goes on, uh, Ukraine, uh, the, the Ukraine issue becomes uh, entangled with domestic politics in the US, most notably, but also intra-European problems. So uh, there's a need to keep signaling uh, that there's a need to keep moving ahead on things. And there's, there has to be that sense of urgency. Uh, you know, I think Canada and its announcement of a NASAM system that kind of isn't, nobody's really sure where it's at a year out uh, from the announcement uh, shows that there is an urgency issue everywhere, including Canada. Andre, how worried are, are you about that? Uh, that? That the world is, if it's not turning its back on Ukraine, it's sort of losing focus, losing, you know, urgency, as Roman describes it. What's your concern level there and what's happening in Western countries as this drags on? Two things. First, uh, timing is crucial. One of the reasons the counteroffensive in 2023 was not as successful as we had planned it to be, because we had given too much time uh, to the Russians to prepare with the minefields and uh, with other ways uh, to... Um, to meet the Western weapons. Second thought, our long-term strategy is the same. We must find a way to buy several decades of good, proper, genuine peace in Europe and in the world. And uh, we must be very strategic with that. I think we are moving in that direction. Only in the first year of war, we have stripped Russia out of 50% uh, of, of its uh, land-based uh, attack of operational capabilities. We have made the Black Sea Fleet dysfunctional. We have exhausted their missile arsenal. So in a way, we are making the world safer, but we are paying a very heavy price for that. Just on that, I know you regained a lot of the territory in the early push of the counteroffensive, but as you say, Russia was able to entrench and fortify its defensive positions. And it seems like it's fighting back and forth over a few hundred meters of land at a time. The line has gotten a little bit static right now. And I was reading a report that there could be a delay in the F-16s uh, uh, being ready to go. Uh, how would you describe the state uh, of the actual conflict on the battlefield on the front line right now in Ukraine? Well, it's, it's a very active uh, combat zone. Uh, so one way to see it, it reminds to many what we... Uh, read about World War One, mm. and from the from, from the early weeks of the war, it was a nightmare of the Ukrainian generals. We know we wanted to avoid this scenario of getting into this sort of trench World War One style wars. Uh, on the second uh, uh, hand, uh, um, it's a lot about technology which is being used. We see how important uh, is uh, how important are the drones. The F-16s in the future are going to to play a major uh, difference because there is and there is an obvious disadvantage disadvantage when it comes to technology right now and when you talk about the skies. Roman, um, we're we're a week away, less than a week away from the Iowa caucus, less than two months away from Super Tuesday as we head into the U.S. presidential election cycle, where Donald Trump is very likely to be the Republican candidate. If he wins, U.S. support for Ukraine very much in doubt. What does that mean for Ukraine, potentially, for your perspective, a Trump victory in the fall? Uh, it would be very problematic. I think uh, Nikki Haley has a lot of fans now in Ukraine. Uh, but uh, I think it means a rethinking for Europeans and then also for Canadians, because uh, a Trump uh, second term is a huge challenge uh, for Canadian uh, security policy, which has assumed, been built on the assumption of being a bit of a free rider on the U.S., uh, I think there needs to be a kind of a, in that situation, a kind of uh, non-U.S. transatlantic and, and fr frankly, worldwide discussion of how security can be maintained. I think the, the Europeans, a lot of them now realize they've got 12 months uh, to figure out how they can ramp up industrial production, how they can galvanize some of their 
uh, own security structures or a European pillar of NATO interaction, uh, because that is a definite threat. Andrea, I wonder, you know, the first time I think a lot of people uh, heard of Volodymyr Zelensky here in North America was going back to the first, to the Trump administration and, and his attempts to, you know, get information on Hunter Biden and, and leaning on the president that way. Uh, what's the concern level uh, uh, in Kyiv, in Ukraine, of the possibility of a change in leadership in the White House in the United States and what that could mean for your country? I think we are much more concerned with uh with uh, short-term challenges that come with the political turbulence in Washington, D.C. right now, mm. as we speak. Because we are going to feel an immediate uh, impact of the turbulence uh, in terms of military assistance and so on. When, we, when it comes to the future, I think we must think, uh, we must uh, take more strategic approach. I think by now we have learned that we can uh, work with anyone and everyone. Uh, in terms of uh, bringing uh, our truth forward. And I think it's very important to make sure that all the collective mechanisms of defense, of security, can uh, be used efficiently. Roman, I guess just as a final point, what would be a reason, as you look at the state of things right now, to be optimistic for Ukraine uh, in, in 2024? I mean, in the early days of this, you know, the Russians were right outside Kyiv. The headlines were it's going to fall in 48 hours. Clearly, uh, it's gone in a very different direction. But what's a reason uh, to, to be optimistic for prospects uh, in, in this year? Well, in my professional business center world, we've had about 6% uh, growth on a rebound uh, in 2023. Uh, we have Ukraine through its uh, own uh, land-based missile attacks on the Russian fleet in the Black Sea re-establishing export routes and putting millions of tons monthly out through uh, Odessa and uh, the uh, Danube ports. So I think uh, the fact that Ukraine remains viable, albeit with significant Western financial and military assistance, is uh, a sign uh, and cause for optimism. Roman Waschuk, Andrei Shevchenko, thank you so much for your time today. We appreciate it.